Very warm welcome to the France 24 debate. Alexei Navalny is tonight in custody in Moscow. The Russian opposition leader was arrested immediately on his return. Navalny issued this statement via his social media. Вот этот тот самый дед в бункере настолько всего боится, что просто какой-то демонстративно разорвали и выкинули на помойке уголовно процессуальный кодекс. Это невозможно то, что происходит здесь. Это просто какой-то наивысшей степени беззакония. Navalny, of course, continues to be very much a thorn on the side of uh, President Vladimir Putin. And tonight we're examining the case in our debate here on France 24. Germany has demanded Navalny's immediate release. It was in Berlin that Alexei Navalny was treated after he was poisoned with Novichok nerve agent in August. Russia has denied attempting to kill him in that incident. Navalny has become very much, as we say, a problem that won't go away for Vladimir Putin. His influence is gaining ground beyond Russia's borders, though, since the attempt on his life in Siberia last summer. Here to discuss the case, the man and the next steps are in Moscow, uh, Tanya Lokshina, who's from Human Rights Watch. Uh, Tanya, a very good evening to you. Uh, in Moscow, too, Theo Mertz, France 24's correspondent. They're following this story for us. Hello to you, Theo. And in Moscow as well, Mark Sloboda, an international affairs and security analyst. Thank you all for joining us. First, this report on the Maldives' return to Russia by Kami Nedelec. First in hospital, now behind bars. A court ruled that Alexei Navalny will not be released from police custody until at least mid-February, prompting the anti-corruption campaigner to call for mass protests. Чего боится эта жаба, сидящая на трубе? Чего боятся эти бункерные воры больше всего? Вы сами отлично знаете выхода людей на улицы. Потому что это та вещь, тот политический фактор, который нельзя игнорировать. Он самый главный, самый важный. Это суть политики. Поэтому не бойтесь, выходите на улицы. Выходите не за меня, выходите за себя и за свое будущее. His lawyers, meanwhile, were left waiting outside, denied access to him. Navalny was taken into custody upon his return to Russia on Sunday, after the Federal Prison Service gave him just 24 hours to report to their offices last month. This was in line with the terms of a suspended sentence set to expire just a day after that deadline. But the campaigner had been in Germany since the summer, after he was poisoned with the nerve agent Novichok. Britain, Germany, the US and a number of other Western countries are calling for Navalny's release. His poisoning resulted in sanctions against Russia, and Estonia, Lithuania and the Czech Republic are calling on the EU to discuss further curbs. But Russia's response was scathing. We see how the news has been taken away from the last news about the return of Navalny to the Russian Federation. Western politicians think that they can be able to distract attention from the deepest crisis in which the liberal model was developed. A court will now decide whether Navalny will serve his suspended sentence of almost four years in prison, as he also faces fresh charges, this time of embezzlement, which Amnesty International says are politically motivated. Many issues uh, to discuss. So we need to say first that uh, Alexei Navalny is uh, in prison now for 30 days. Uh, we take it from there after that. And I'm told that it is the first time he's been to a, a proper uh, Russian prison. That uh, coming from our correspondent uh, in Moscow, who will be joining very shortly. Let's go first, though, uh, to our uh, first guest in Moscow, Mark Sloboda, who is uh, an international affairs and security analyst with uh, an insight into the Putin administration. Mark, thanks for joining us. Um, do you agree this whole situation regarding Navalny looks very questionable indeed? Um, do you specifically mean his arrest? Uh, no. His arrest uh, by was announced uh, by the Russian Federal Penitentiary Service uh, before he even returned to the country. They warned him that he was in repeated violation of the terms of his suspended uh, sentence awarded uh, in the case brought by the French cosmetics firms, Yves Rocher against him, accusations that this case is somehow politicized or a bit bizarre, and you must have some type of conspiratorial worldview that Vladimir Putin controls Yves Rocher. I, I seriously doubt that myself. Um, but it was announced, if he did not return to the country to meet the terms of the probation in time, that he would be arrested on his return. He did not return on time, despite being given a bill of health after his miraculous recovery from this alleged poisoning uh, that the German military says he suffered. 
Um, he did not return on time. Uh, he then returned later, and uh, he was arrested on arrival. It was all uh, pretty much pre-announced, and there is no surprising development whatsoever. Max Lebota, thank you very much indeed for clarifying the perspective uh, from, um, well, from, from, from Vladimir Putin. Let's put it that way. Let's bring in from Human Rights Watch, uh, Tanya uh, Lokashina, who is uh, joining us uh, from, uh, equally from Moscow. Tanya, thanks for being with us. Um, from your perspective, obviously we heard what Mark had to say, and clearly that is one take on the story. How do you see it? Well, it's a clearly quite politically motivated arrest. And it is also crystal clear that in this particular manner, the Kremlin is attempting to eliminate, to silence its key political opponent and a very powerful critical voice. And I have to say that most unfortunately, uh, in recent years, Human Rights Watch documented numerous cases of politically motivated prosecutions. But as a rule, at least until now, the Russian authorities took care to do some window dressing to at least pretend that whatever they were doing had legitimate basis. In this particular case, Navalny's arrest today was so clearly lawless, shameless and cynical that, frankly, there is no window dressing involved. So as far as you're concerned, uh, basically, your, your point of view is very much the opposite to what Marx Lebode has just said. Well, I mean, of course, the authorities found a quote-unquote legitimate reason uh, to jail Mr. Navalny, but it is indeed laughable. The uh, allegations that Mr. Navalny breached the conditions of his parole came as soon as he announced his intention to return to Russia. At that point, Russian penitentiary authorities claimed that he would not show up for his meetings with penitentiary officers, one of the conditions of his parole and suspended sentence, and that they actually had no idea as to his whereabouts. Now, the latter point is particularly ridiculous, given that Navalny's transfer to Germany following on his poisoning was sanctioned by the country's top authorities and made international headlines. So how in the world could they not know where Navalny was and why he was not able to make the meeting is a mystery, to put it euphemistically. Uh, so, yes, on the one hand, uh, I would agree with Mark that they did find a reason to jail him, but the reason is simply laughable. What's very clear here is political motivation of the case and the fact that uh, instead of investigating Navalny's own shocking allegations about uh, the Federal Security Service, FSB, allegedly poisoning him with Novichok nerve agent, uh, instead of investigating those allegations, the authorities are finding a pretext to send Navalny to prison for several years. Indeed. The, German, uh, the Germans confirming, I think, that Novichok was the substance involved that Navalny was poisoned with. Uh, Mark Sloboda, I know you're casting doubt on that from your perspective, uh, but uh, this idea that this whole charge brought up against a uh, uh, Navalny was, was was trumped up in order to get him be behind bars. Uh, what would you say to that? Well, I would uh, suggest that Ms. Lokshana take this up with the legal team of the French cosmetics firms Yves Rocher, because the last I heard from them, they were still pretty irate about the several hundred thousand dollars that Navalny and his brother built out of them. Um, again, uh, I, I don't know what control Vladimir Putin has over Yves Rocher, uh, what, what, what kind of nefarious pool, uh, but I would suggest that she take the legitimacy up of, the, of this case up with Yves Rocher's uh, legal team. Second of all, to refer to Alexei Navalny as, as Putin's principal opposition in the country is simply a laughable uh, reversal of reality. Alexei Navalny is a fringe, far-right, ultra-nationalist figure who has the support of about 2% approval by the Russian people in repeated 
uh, uh, polling, no matter who does it, including from his own, which did give him 3 percent approval by the Russian people. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation is the principal opposition party. The, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which isn't really liberal democratic and isn't a party, it's a, a cult, comes in either uh, just before or ahead of them. Navalny has no rating uh, effective in these polls. He is a manufactured uh, anti-Putin opponent by the Western press, which is his real constituency. Um, this is despite his openly xenophobic, um, racist and anti-Islamic views. He has headlined Russian ultranationalist marches in Moscow. He has led race riots outside of Moscow. He has suggested that the solution to the immigrant problem in Russia is to hand out guns to white ethnic Russians. Alexei Navalny is to the right of Marine Le Pen, but the Western press um, fawns over him, adores him. They platform and they promote him because he's anti-Putin. That's that is simply the reason. They'll they'll support anyone, be it jihadists in Syria, uh, right-wing dictators in South America, uh, or or ultranationalists in Ukraine and Russia, as as long as it's uh, against the Russian government. Mark, I, I disagree with you completely about the role of the Western press. But let me we can talk about this at length. Obviously, I'm just getting that on, out on the table now. Um, but uh, you know, your opinion is is valid because you're in our debate, and we thank you for being here. Uh, Tanya uh, Lokoshina, you were listening to what Mark was saying. Uh, Mark uh, uh, Sloboda there, uh, you're both in Moscow, uh, you both have a real view on what's going on, but your views are very different. He's described Navalny as someone who is a, a, a real extremist there. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't think we are here to discuss Mr. Navalny's uh, xenophobic views, even though, of course, he made quite a few xenophobic statements, and I'm not denying that. We are not talking about his political agenda as such. What we are talking about is that he is indeed the most visible opposition politician in the country. And I would also dare argue that if the Kremlin had not been afraid of Mr. Navalny, the Kremlin would not have locked him up. So what? Navalny is returning to Russia. Let him return. Let him go home. What is this special operation all about? His plane, which was supposed to land at Vnukova airport in Moscow, gets diverted and lands at another airport. The Vnukova airport in Moscow was full of riot police and full protective gear, as if there were an anti-terrorist operation going on. It is pretty clear that the authorities are afraid of Navalny, and that is the reason they want him silenced. That is the reason they want him in jail. As far as the political opposition in Russia goes, the parliament, unfortunately, is no longer an independent institution. It is controlled by the government. And as regards uh, different opposition figures, one has to understand that the Kremlin over the years has effectively mopped up the political arena to eliminate any healthy political competition. And yes, indeed, in uh, this situation, Mr. Navalny is the one most recognized both domestically and internationally. I would also suggest that the way the Kremlin is treating Mr. Navalny now is gaining him more supporters, is actually gaining him more attention. So even from the very pragmatic standpoint, what they are doing is not only lawless, but completely counterproductive. Uh, Tanya, just I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you for the moment. Now, Mark, um, Mark Sloboda raised well, a bit of scepticism about the Novichok uh, poisoning. Um, Germany confirmed it, um, and that, that's the line I'm going with. Um, Tanya, do you have fears for Alexei Navalny now that he's been sent to uh, a bona fide Russian prison? Uh, well, there are good reasons to believe that uh, when Mr. Navalny has his court hearing about breach of parole on the 29th of January, that's the date for which the court hearing is scheduled, he may be found, quote unquote, guilty and then sent to prison for three and a half years. That is a legitimate fear. But Jeff fears for his actual safety, given there's already been one attempt on his life. 
Uh, if your question is whether we have grounds to fear for his life in the Russian penitentiary, uh, I think it's more about a prison sentence than uh, uh, about having reasons to believe that something uh, would happen to Mr. Navalny at uh, uh, Matroskoye Tishina, where he was transferred earlier today. Tanya Logshina of Human Rights Watch in Moscow. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mark Slobodov, I'll come back to you for a quick comment as we're running out of time in this first half, but you're here for the second half. I'm grateful for that. Um, it does, you know, it fits into Vladimir Putin's agenda to have someone like Navalny locked away and uh, off the political scene. Uh, no, actually, Navalny is incredibly useful for the Kremlin uh, with, a, with a, quote, lead liberal pro-Western opposition figure. Again, we ignore any political opposition in Russia that is not pro-Western, uh, like the communists and elder Bayar, et cetera. Um, he prevents any more popular, uh, you know, less, uh, someone with less odious, less nationalist, less racist views from coming to fore in the country. I, I would say that the greatest use he has is to Western intelligence agencies that want to destabilize the country and create a martyr figure out of him. Mark, we will um, take you. We will I, take I, that point up in part two. I've got to cut you off, sir. Sorry about that. We will pick up where we left off in part two. Uh, please, uh, everyone, stay with us. Uh, this is the France 24 debate. in Moscow following the story. And we're joined also by Florent Parmentier, who is a political scientist at Sciences Po uh, here in Paris. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Theo, uh, sorry, let's go back to Mark, because I promised you, Mark, I'd go back to that point you were making about Western intelligence. You were saying, I think, that Alexei Navalny is useful uh, to Western intelligence. Can you be a bit more precise about what you're saying in that? Sure. I mean, Obama's director of the CIA, John Brennan, tweeted just over a month ago that he wants to see Joe Biden as president of the United States and Alexei Navalny as the president of the Russian Federation, and we're halfway there. I mean, I don't know how much more blatant we need to be about it. I mean, does Navalny have to wear a CIA cap? I mean, his participation in this ridiculous fable about him being uh, poisoned with magic underpants, uh, Navalny's poison, penis poisoned by the most deadly poison in the world, a weapon of mass destruction too deadly to use, according to the New York Times. And in what you're saying, uh, Germany is not telling the truth. Yeah, I, I, I do not believe the German military. They have refused to release their medical data uh, of their diagnosis uh, to the Russian government so that they could conduct an investigation. Why? Is there, is there the same kind of openness you're calling for coming from the Russians, though? I mean, be fair. I'm sorry? It's the same kind of openness that you're calling for. Is it coming from the Russians as well? Be fair. Are, are the Russians calling? No, it's the same German? kind of openness that you were calling for. Is it coming from the Russians too? Yeah, the Russian government has called for the German military to release their diagnosis data. Yes. Okay, but, but, but there's no, it's the same openness coming from the Russians. They're making the call, but are they being as open as they want everyone else to be? I think that's the question. Mark, well, they've released their medical data of Navalny when he was in Siberia, and I don't know what happened to him after he got on this uh, charter plane from this shady German NGO, Cinema for Peace Foundation, and I have no idea what happened to him in, in, in Germany, but I would think it would behoove the German government to conduct an, an independent investigation of what happened to him after that. Uh, and for the German military to back up their claims with actual factual data. OK. He's, of course, Germany is saying that he's taken there, he's treated, and he's come out miraculously and been cured. So that, that's obviously, we yeah. know that's the situation. Mark, thank you. Let me bring in uh, our correspondent in Moscow, uh, Theo Mertz, who's following the story for us. Uh, Theo, the, the situation, as Mark has described it, uh, Navalny landed. It was expected he'd be arrested, yet he came back. Uh, what, what is the kind of feeling you're getting from people in Moscow about the situation? Well, whether he was expecting to be arrested. I mean, obviously, he, when he came back, he knew there was a very high chance he would be arrested, almost certainly would be arrested. I was at the airport. He was supposed to land out for most of the afternoon, most of the day yesterday. I was speaking with supporters there, and even his most diehard supporters were saying, 
they didn't expect for anything more than that. But even so, they wanted to come out and and show that they were with him, show that they didn't they show that they didn't think the the Russian state could get away with with what they've been accused of and what these supporters believe they have done, which is poison Navalny. They've been outraged. By the way, this has been treated by Russia, the way Russian officials have talked about it, the way Putin laughed during his end of year press conference last year that if we had wanted to kill him, if the FSB had wanted to kill him, they would have finished the job. They just think that's not the way a country they live in um, should behave. So that's why they came out, even though they knew there was that risk of arrest. And yes, that was certainly not a, a massive surprise, but it was a disappointment and quite shocking in some ways, nonetheless, for his supporters. What is the sense among those supporters, uh, Theo, tonight? Obviously, um, Navalny in jail. Are they fearful about what might happen to him? Yeah, there certainly is amongst his inner circle. There's there's that fear because they believe there he is now in the hands of the people who tried to kill him a few months ago. So it's natural to have that fear. They are saying, however, in all their social media posts and all their YouTube videos that are calling people out to protests on on um, on Saturday at the weekend. They're saying, "Don't be afraid." Um, it's the authorities that should be afraid of us because we're the ones who want change. Even Navalny's wife made an Instagram post earlier and she said, I know that we'll get through this, that get through this, we got through the poisoning. So there's sort of some optimism, maybe forced optimism, even amongst all these all this bleak news for the for the Navalny camp today. Theo Mertz, our correspondent there in Moscow. Thank you very much indeed. Stay with us. I'll get back to you very shortly. Let's bring in our uh, guest who's just joining us, Florent Parmartier, who is a political scientist here at uh, Science Book. Good evening to you, sir. Uh, I hope you've been listening to uh, the first part uh, of our debate, which was lively indeed. Uh, we heard from Mark Sloboda that uh, Navalny is basically a charlatan uh, in many ways, who is an extremist, and basically his uh, jailing is the most just thing you could imagine. We heard from Tanya Lokshina uh, from Human Rights Watch in Moscow, basically saying the exact opposite, uh, which is the narrative narrative which comes from Western reporting, uh, says Mark uh, Sloboda. Um, in your perspective, Florent, for your analysis and that standpoint you have of being slightly back from the story, how do you see this? How do you see Alexei Navalny? I think we have um, two things here that should be, uh, on, on, on which we should put in fairness. How should we see Mr. Navalny and how uh, do we think that the Russian government is seeing Mr. Navalny? But Mr. Navani, what is sure is that he's an anti-corruption activist, very gifted in a sense that uh, he has managed to, to leverage some support within uh, some part of the public opinion. And um, he, was, uh, he was good enough to secure some 27% of the vote in Moscow, which is, of course, the capital, but still is far from inexistent, as uh, some have described, although we may agree that is probably, as an oppositionist, not uh, the most successful uh, for now. But what we see is that um, he, he has made a, a bet, and I think that he has made a bet on the Russian government's uh, position. His bet is, I will offer me as, an host, as, as a hostage in this situation. And we know that the Russian government has already had political hostages, like Mr. Sensov or um, Mr. Ms. Savchenko. Uh, some um, Ukrainian uh, opponents that were hostage in, in Russia. So this kind of uh, political um, situation uh, for Mr. Navalny is, is the following one. It's the idea that um, if they don't apply some violence against me, they will see the power as weak. So, or like in a weaker position, so uh, they, have to, they have to take me and send me in prison. But if they send me in prison, what is seen is, well, after all, uh, people will start to to it will start to to make a to be a catalyst for some um, I would say some growing discontent among the Russian public opinion. So, he, Mr. Navani put himself in a position both as of hostage, but also maybe uh, as uh, he is taking a, a bet for for the future. A provocative thing to do, of course. A very provocative thing to do. Very provocative, uh, very courageous, but maybe in the end very sensitive. That's what we will see. Of course, his bet is uh, not without risks, and that's what we said. But my uh, my understanding of this is like um, 
if the, the, the Russian government goes too far, uh, it will have two risks. One risk is, is uh, from the outside world. But the Russian government is here answering that, well, we are not afraid of your sanctions. That's what basically they say when, when they take Mr. Navalny uh, and, and put him in prison. But there is also another meaning, which is uh, for, for the domestic audience, which says that, um, well, we, of course, if we need uh, to sacrifice uh, some of our rule of law model, we will do it. Uh, in, in this way, um, it would be interesting to see, and maybe that, that's the next uh, thing about Mr. Navani. Will this uh, new, um, uh, new episodes of be being uh, imprisoned lead him to marginalization in, in the political game of Russia? Because he, could not, he would not be able to present himself for the next elections. Or uh, is he coming back to the center of the Russian political um, discussion? Uh, and, and among the oppositionists, uh, he will appear undeniably as, as a martyr, as someone who, uh, ha who, who you can praise him for, for being courageous, even if, you're not, if, if you do not agree with his position, what you may say is, OK, this guy is coherent and is, uh, is not afraid of what, what, can, what can happen next. And, and that's something that um, is for him maybe a, a very good asset if you want to lead the opposition. Florent van Martier from uh, Sevipov Sciences Po here in Paris. Thank you for that analysis. Let's bring back in uh, Mark Sloboda, international affairs and security analyst uh, with, uh, well, close to the Putin uh, administration, I think it's fair to say, Mark. I wish. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, it, I hope it proves to be lucrative as well as fruitful. Uh, Mark, in terms of what we've just heard from Florent Parmentier there, um, Navalny, very much a, a brave person who is trying to position himself politically uh, to change Russia. Uh, just the sort of person that, well, your friend Vladimir Putin might fear. Um, yes, I, I think the Russian government does fear once again, your analyst, like the Human Rights uh, Watch a young woman that you spoke to, doesn't want to talk about Alexei Navalny's actual political views. They want to paint him. That's indeed how he has tried to rebrand himself as an anti-corruption crusader, uh, coming from a guy uh, who was brought to case by the French cosmetics firm Yves Rocher uh, uh, for fraud and embezzlement. I think you have to take such claims with a, with a grain of salt. And certainly, the majority of the Russian population uh, doesn't take, uh, you know, his work in that regard very seriously. But he is a far-right, ultra-nationalist figure who has led race riots and ultra-nationalist marches. Justifi course, and you're saying justifiably in jail. That's what you're saying, isn't it? He's justifiably in jail tonight. On, on, I would actually jail him on, on much broader charges than the Russian government. They have a, a legitimate technical reason for the violation of uh, his, uh, you know, probation and a suspended sentence against the French cosmetics firm Yves Rocher. I don't know what you have against Yves Rocher. Uh, uh, or that you doubt, uh, you know, the legitimacy of their legal case. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not debating Yves Rocher. I'm debating why because Navalny's in like jail. That's are. the issue. It sounds like you are. No, not at all. You're bringing it up all the time, sir. I think it's your issue. Can I just pause you for a second and get our correspondent Please. in Moscow to give us a, a perspective on this one? Uh, Mark Sloboda there. Thank you very much indeed. And do stay with us. Uh, Theo Mertz, our correspondent there uh, in Moscow. Navalny's in jail, Theo. You've been speaking to his supporters. They're expressing some concern about m what might happen next. In terms of the, the broader political scene in Moscow, in terms of opposition, we've heard from Mark Sloboda saying that Navalny is basically a, a peripheral figure. He's an extremist. He's uh, far right of the far right. He's got very uh, questionable political views uh, and questionable activities. But on the other side of the equation, we're hearing from Human Rights Watch that he's being basically framed politically. Um, what perspective are you getting in reporting this story? Well, I think it's it's true that they, he has made some nationalist comments in the past and he has appeared at some events that he would possibly now distance himself from. This is all a very long time ago. This is not a sort of ongoing part of his political appeal. He is a anti-corruption activist. What he does is um, he investigates corruption among officials and then 
posts about it on his social media channels largely, and then calls protests, calls protests against those corrupt officials, or when he feels that he and his supporters and other opposition figures are being shut out of political life. So he, um, as Mark may say, that he polled very, his polling numbers are very low in Russia, Russian national surveys, that's true. I mean, he's kept off state television. Vladimir Putin won't even mention his name on state television. Um, he, he, rarely, he rarely appears on state media unless it's in events like today where he's presented as a criminal. So he doesn't get a particularly rounded hearing with um, the Russian public who get their news from television. He comes, his appeal is mainly in younger people who get their news from um, social media and online. But even if he is, even if he does have these low poll numbers, he is able to call out huge protests. And we've seen that time and time again, tens of thousands of people on the streets when he um, uh, made an investigation into the former Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev's um, alleged corruption, and there were tens of thousands of people on the streets of Moscow and elsewhere two years ago in 2019 after some of his supporters, some other major opposition figures were kept off the ballot paper in local elections. So he does have that pulling power. Whatever you think about him, he, he can get people on the streets as he is suggesting to do this weekend. So I think it'll be very interesting to see whether people do turn up, whether this is something they do care enough to turn up en masse for, or whether, as the Kremlin is hoping, they will stay at home, that this doesn't feel like quite the outrage of the, the major events that have drawn people out to protest in, in recent years. Indeed. Bitter cold, obviously, in the winter. That uh, obviously goes, goes without saying. Um, is it possible that those demonstrations might be policed in a very, well, I'll say robust way? Uh, that's probably an understatement. In a very what way? Sorry, I didn't robust way. In a very robust way. Yes, yes, I think it would be fair to say they'd be policed in a robust way. I was at the the demonstrations here in 2019, a couple of years ago, and there were batons used on protesters, people dragged into police vans, even in front of journalists, even while people were taking pictures. So I think if there are, if there do happen to be mass protests at the weekend, I think we can safely assume there would be that kind of response. And I mean, even at the airport yesterday where I was waiting before his landing along with many, many other journalists and hundreds of his supporters, there were a lot of riot police there and there were some pretty robust arrests there with, with dogs, people being dragged out of the, of the airport terminal. So it's, it's not going to be a hands-off approach um, if these protests do go ahead of the weekend. Theo Mertz, thank you very much indeed for your um, analysis and your uh, testimony there. Thank you very much indeed for giving us that insight into, into what goes on. First-hand experience, eyewitness experience. Theo, thank you. Mark Sloboda, um, Alexei Navalny uh, in jail. Uh, he never gets on national television. He can't create a profile politically. And of course, if his supporters turn out to demonstrate, the chances are they might be, well, uh, met with very robust policing by the, the Russian authorities. Uh, this does not sound like the kind of democracy that you would like to say Russia is. I, I don't know. Um, my, myself, uh, giving someone who is the equivalent of Tommy Robinson in the UK a national uh, TV platform, I, I know the Western mainstream media likes to put him on, uh, you know, basically every other report they talk uh, about Russia. But no, the Russian uh, media does not promote this far-right fringe ultra It's not promoting, figure. it's giving people the right to speak, isn't it? Dated views. It's freedom, uh, it's freedom of expression, Walker isn't it? John Walker of The Guardian asked him two years ago if he takes back his earlier positions. And he said, no, I regret nothing. So th this isn't ancient history. This is an issue of rebranding. And tens of thousands of people in Moscow a city of some 10 to 14 million is not mass protest. Mass protests are like what we saw in Paris with the yellow vests when they have repeatedly been brutally crushed, I'm sorry, robustly policed by the French police state. 
Uh, we don't see anything of that sort in Moscow, uh, no matter how much Navalny uh, uh, goads authorities by walking into oncoming traffic and the like. Mark, thank you very much indeed. The policing of the Yellow Vest protest in Paris was, was, was bad. There were lots of things to question. The United Nations raised it. Uh, we in France 24 have raised it too. And we have spoken to people who were terribly, uh, awfully wounded by uh, flashballs and things like that. So nothing being hidden at this end of that story. Mark, uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Let's bring in Florent Palmati for what I think will be the final comment on this one. Uh, Florent, uh, Alexei Navalny, um, what happens next for him, do you think? I think <clears throat> the situation for Mr Navalny depends on a balance of power, which will be determined and defined by three different uh, levels. The first level will be the various clans of powers in the Kremlin, that uh, some of them will go for being softer on uh, Mr. Navalny, and some others would insist on um, uh, targeting him and, uh, and, and hit him uh, very hard. And, and no, you, you'd have the first level will, will be this one. Another level would be the level of the international pressure that will be put on Russia in order to give uh, more free, uh, to give uh, to, to free Mr. Navalny. Uh, and, and that would be so, that, that's a process which is already ongoing, as uh, more than 10 countries have already uh, stated that they condemn the arrest of Mr. Navalny. So that's the second level. And the third level would be the mobilization of the Russian uh, opposition. So we will see from those three different uh, elements of the balance of power, the various clans of power and how the inner circles will fight one against the other. Uh, the, the international pressure and the mobilization, of course, of the Russian opposition and, and the, the Russian public opinion. I think all of this uh, will um, probably be determinant in, in, the, in, in what would happen for, for Mr. Uh, Navalny and for, for the reaction of the Russian authorities. So they cannot uh, free him, uh, I mean, too soon. But maybe in the long run, what they will see is probably that the cost would be uh, very important or someone that they claim is not that important. So that either is important and they are ready to pay the price, or is not that important, and at some point they will have to, to free him. That's the bet that we, we can see. Florent Palmont here from Sciences Po. Thank you very much indeed. Mark Sloboda, Theo Mertz, and Tanya Lokshina in Moscow. Thank you all for joining us here on the France 24 debate. And uh, thanks to you for watching. Do stay with us. You're watching France 24.